Yeah, we can. Uh, you want to tighten this up? Okay, so um, this is going to be an interactive session. Um, you guys will get to participate. Yep, yeah, good. Um, I'm going to talk about um, power, a uh, significant element in the design of your projects is going to be the power source, um, how long it lasts, okay? the, um, the cost of it, um, whether it's efficiency, whether or not it's, it's a, um, a cost and performance efficient power supply. Um, first, I don't know if you have paid much attention to it, but there's been a lot in the press about how expensive Austin has become to reside in, and one of the costs uh, is insurance. So the question is, why is insurance so expensive? Okay, so some of the news people traveled around Austin and they took some pictures to illustrate why insurance companies are charging so much money for insurance in Austin. I'm just going to give you a few samples. Okay. So here is a um, fellow working in one of the shops in North Austin, and he's sending sparks all over his welding tanks. Okay. And that contributes to, to the expense um, here's over on West Campus, okay, and what we've got is we've got some people, um, looks like they're taking out a television set, um, uh, okay. Um, also on West Campus, somebody uh, moving into their apartment. Um, This is um, this is up in Hyde Park, okay. Uh, a guy working on a on a chimney there. Okay. This is uh, this is over on Sixth Street. Okay. Um, so notice we've got one, two, three, four people um, standing on top of a uh, bus. Um, some more stuff on, on West Campus. This is uh, how you get to places that are a little, a little difficult. This is on the Castilian, okay, and this is uh, one of your fellow students, okay, um, with his feet through the railing, uh, hanging upside down, and that, that accomplishes something. Um, <laughs> this is uh, uh, going down the drag, okay, uh, bringing something home from, it wouldn't quite fit in the vehicle, I guess. Okay. This is uh, over on Riverside, um, changing uh, one of the light lamps, you know, they're changing them from uh, um, 
sodium vapor lamps into LEDs, and that's how you do it these days. <laughs> uh, this is when your widescreen TV is a little wider than your vehicle. Uh, definitely raises the cost of insurance. Um, notice, I don't know if you can see, but the way that, ele that ladder is held up is there's three guys at the bottom holding it up. Okay, and, uh, the guy at the top. I guess what all he has to do is he's painting something. All he has to do is hold the brush and the guys at the bottom just... <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, over in Hyde Park, uh, when the scaffolding, you don't have it, you just build it in place. Um, this is a guy up in northwest Austin and he's uh, mowing the ivy on his uh, on his wall there, and the easiest way to do it is hire a crane, pick up your uh, riding lawnmower, and just. I don't know why the guy needs to sit on it because you know he can't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, um, notice the support here. Okay, so he's got a picnic table. Okay, with something under that, and on top of that, and then a couple of cement blocks, and then a ladder. Okay, very. This one is particularly nice too. I mean, the guy. Uh, this is the Austin. I don't know if you've noticed, but Austin uh, has been losing a lot of water. They lost five billion gallons of water out of their um, water system this past year. And so they're down there fixing the leaks in the pipes. And so there's this big boulder here, and they just prop it up with a couple of sticks, and they send a the guy down there and, and work on it. This, this is due to the traffic congestion. Okay, the cars are now going to drive on two wheels. <laughs> These guys are out practicing, okay, because you can fit a lot more cars in the road if you've got them on two wheels than on four. This next one is a bunch of ECE students um, in the pool at their apartment. Okay. And notice, okay, they got their um, they got their electric outlet uh, floating on a pair of flip flops, which is a novel idea. <laughs> and they're all in there, and it's probably a 445L experiment. Okay, going on on the table. Notice the beer bottles. That helps understand embedded systems. <laughs> um, there's this one. Um, this was also over on Riverside. Um, notice the creative way that the um, the vehicle is is being elevated there. Um, Front end is in the back of a pickup truck. The rear end is uh, uh, supported by some really, really efficient-looking uh, props. Um, this is out at the airport again. If you, if your one forklift can't do it, then what you do is you go get another forklift and you lift the first forklift with the second forklift, and that puts the load where you need it. Finally, uh, this is over in Gregory Gym. Okay, so we got a guy working out with weights. Okay, and he's doing it on top of a ball. Okay, so this this I guess does something for you. Okay. <laughs> so in case anybody asks, why is insurance so expensive in Austin? You can, you can see what that is. Um. <coughs> So your project um, needs to adhere to a power budget. Uh, how long does the does your project need to run? 
How much power does it consume per unit time? Um, many of your projects, if not most of them, will be done with, what's yours going to be done with? Are you going to do power it with batteries? Um, you need a battery or USB, USB plug-in. USB driven by what? By a computer? Uh, either a computer or a battery, I guess, yeah. We don't know yet. You don't know yet? Okay. okay. What about yours? Uh, battery. Battery, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> what kind of battery? We're on different teams. Yeah. You <laughs> what? We're on different teams. Oh, well, I mean, it's, what, what kind of battery are you going to use? Uh, 7.4 volt pump. Okay. Lithium ion battery? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, if you've got a battery, um, you may need to be able to charge it. Um, you also have the issue of voltage regulation. So you got regulators and there are two basic types. There are linear regulators, what are called linear regulators, and there are buck boost regulators. Um, they operate very, very differently. So, what would you expect that regulators do? I'm going to walk over here on the other side. What do you think regulators do? Regulate voltage. What does that mean? Bring it down to whatever value you want to be at to drive your system. Bring it down. What do you think? What's the linear regulator does? No, what a regulator, regu let's leave the, ad, the adjective off and just think about it. Just keep something at some value that you want to specify, like uh, so that it's not off sliding too high above, or not off sliding, but it's not too high above, or too far below. Okay, but oscillating. Okay. Good work. Okay. Basically, we've got the issue that we've got a power source, okay. and that power source may have excursions above and below the voltages that we really like. What we want is we want for our, in particular for our digital systems, we want a consistent voltage level all the time. So for your launch pad, for your 123, you want what? What voltage do you want? Uh, either 5 or 3.3 .3 volts. 3.3, okay, is what we want. So, how would you design something? I'm going to give you a power source that's 10 volts, okay? And the 10 volts wanders, not periodically, it just wanders, okay? How would you, how would you get that to 3.3 .3 volts? Um, maybe something like a transformer. A transformer. What do you What do you need to do to make a transformer work? Do you need like AC current? You what? AC voltage. Okay. Yeah, you need to make the current. Okay. You need to make the current either alternate. Okay or be intermittent so that the magnetic field can change. Right? Because otherwise you transform. Transformers are pretty dull if you put in DC form. Transformers good idea. What else could you do? Uh, 
What else would you do? Do you think like in one of our labs we use a shunt regulator? What does a shunt regulator do? No, I don't think I have the word correct. <laughs> oh, shunt diode. Yeah, shunt diode. What, what does that do? How does it work? How does it, what, what would you do? I don't know how, how it works. I think there's a property if you apply a reverse bias, it only allows a certain amount of current to go through to hit threshold. Okay. But it's not, it's not well too much on, on shunt diodes, okay? They're, they're kind of the last stage of the pipeline. What would be the simplest, dumbest thing you could do? Well, this divider. Yes, sir. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so you set up a voltage divider. And you say, okay, I got two resistors, right? And you set the ratio of those two resistors such that at the midpoint, you know, your 10 volts comes in here and your 3.3 comes out here. That would do it, wouldn't it? Make it work. So, what else could you do? Anything else you could do? Use an op amp. Who said that? Okay, what would you do with the op amp? You make it like a non-inverting amplifier so the gains that where you want. Okay, so it's not inverting. Okay, what's going to happen when you put something into it? It's going to go one way or the other, isn't it? You don't. Want, I don't think you want. You think you want it with. You want an inverting, don't you, so that you can have a feedback system to say I need more or less. Can you do that with the non-inverting also? Mm. What happens when you have a non-inverting and you put it, put something in on the, on the positive side of it? It's going to. What What's the basic characteristic of the object? It wants to, it's got infinite gain, right? And it wants to make the, the difference between the two inputs go to zero, okay? So it's going to drive that as hard as it can. But I like that op by idea, okay? So, We've got fixed regulators where we basically have an integrated circuit and we say that here's the, the difference that, that we can have in the input voltages that will provide a constant output voltage. Um, we can also have regulators where we can set up resistor networks outside the regulator to provide a variable um, output voltage. Another parameter we we're interested in is how much current can we draw through the regulator. Um, and we basically have two types. We have the linear, and then we have what are known as buck boost. Now, the linear guys, from your perspective, are really cool, okay, because they provide very low noise. They don't, they don't put any <coughs> signals on the output voltage, okay. But they have what's known as a dropout voltage. And what dropout voltage 
is, is it says that if your input voltage gets below a certain level, you get no output at all. Even though, even though the input voltage is above the desired output. So, the input voltage has to be greater than the output voltage plus whatever this thing called V dropout is. And that's a, the V dropout is a function of the particular regulator you're using. Um, a buck boost, okay has the really cool property that you could either have a lower voltage be out to be lower than the input, okay, which is normally the case, or it can be higher. It can be higher. Okay. <clears throat> so um, Here is an example of a linear regulator. Okay. And here's your op amp. Okay. And basically what we have is we have your op amp set up in an inverting mode where basically what it's going to do is it's going to turn this transistor on as much as it as much as it needs to provide enough voltage here so that across the voltage divider we've got the desired voltage. The thing is is that all the time this is turned on this stack of resistors is getting heated up. Okay. You're, you're burning power right there. So, the more um, current that has to be supplied, the more power you're using. The bigger V in is relative to V out, the more power you're going to consume. <clears throat> so, the buck boost is a cool uh, way of doing this, okay? And in this particular mode, in the buck mode, what we're doing is we're doing what the linear regulator does normally, which is take a V in is greater than V out, okay? and what we're going to do is we're going to switch the transistor, that's what that switch is over there. We're going to turn it on and off. Okay. And in doing so, what we're going to what we're going to wind up trying to do is charge up that capacitor. Okay. Charge up the capacitor. We know that the capacitor, how does a capacitor, what's a capacitor charge look like? You, you, let's say we've got no voltage on the capacitor at all. We throw the switch. What does it look like? It is ex exponentially increasing. What do you think? So it's 1 minus E to the minus T over RC, right? So the curve goes like this. Goes like this. Now, what we need to be able to do is put in a pulse to our switch, okay, put in a pulse to our switch that 
make sure that the average voltage that we see on that capacitor, the average voltage that we see on the capacitor, is the output voltage that we're looking at. It's the output voltage that we want. So what we do is do something like that. Now, we're not going to get a real sawtooth. We're going to get curves like this. Okay. Um, but the cool thing is, is if the load changes, okay, all we do to accommodate that is we just adjust our pulses. And we do that automatically. So these things are very efficient. So this, this is in the buck mode. All right? What we're doing is we are taking V in, which is greater than the V out we want. And does anybody see an issue that, that we're going to have with this? What do you think? Pay attention now. What do you think? What issue are we going to have with this type of regulation? Who are you? So we're switching something on and off. that going to do? You? Yes, ma'am. Mm. It might create noise in the circuit. Do what? It might create uh, noise in the circuit. Okay, what we, what we're what we're going to see is we're going to see that curve. We're going to see pieces of that curve. Okay. Hopefully up toward the top where it's getting flat. Mm -hmm. Just as soon as it drops off that, we're going to give it another shot. Right? But we're going to see something that, that has that type of behavior on the output. Unless, okay, and that's the purpose of The inductor, okay. The inductor, okay. What what is the characteristic of an inductor? Okay. A capacitor's primary characteristic is it does not, it will not change voltage instantaneously, right? An inductor will not change its current instantaneously. So our conductor is a, is a a storehouse for current, if you will. That'll help change, smooth out those those things. We can also put LC networks on the output to further smooth it. Okay. But in comparison to a linear regulator, okay, we might expect our buck boost guy to be have have a a more noisy signal. Um, here's the, the boost mode, different configuration. Okay. Here what we're basically doing is we're exploiting the issue of the Inductor, when we change the, um, when we attempt to change the current through the inductor, the voltage that's produced is proportional to the inductance times the change in the current with respect to time. So if we if we're changing a current of, let's say, a milliamp, and we're doing that in nanoseconds, we can get 1,000 volt pulses out the other side. Okay? We can store them on that capacitor. 
So we can take in 3 volts and we can produce 20 volts out the other side. Right? Simply by, again, with our pulse width modulation. Why do we care about this? Suppose that what you need is you need to drive an RS-232 interface. How much voltage do you need for RS-232? Anybody know? Anybody ever hear of RS-232? Okay, so it is the serial line, it is the voltage that's used on uh, UART devices. And it switches minimally between plus and minus 12 voltage. Plus and minus 12 volts. So you need 12 volts and you need minus 12 volts. You can get that from a single buck boost chip. Okay? Put 3 3 in and you get plus and minus 12 out the other side. Okay? And that lets you interface with. Lots of things that run over uh, RS-232. <clears throat> so here's an example of a uh, buck boost. Um, notice the external inductor that's required okay, on the package. Um, notice here what we're basically doing is we've got a 3.37, a 3.7 volt input, so we're right at what we want. Probably a little bit of variation in that 3.7, and we're going to get 3.3 uh, three, three out the other side. So, um, Professor Balvano will have a set of cabinets in his office. And when you um, get ready to populate your project, you'll need to bring a schematic with you and your bill of materials. And what you'll be able to get from him, uh, and that the cool thing about it is that all the parts you get from him don't count against the cost of your project, okay, are um, different types of um, regulators, both linear and, um, and buck boost. So um, you're going to want to think, you're going to want to plan on um, the type of regulation that you're going to need. Uh, and see, in particular, see if what you can do is make the regulators, the regulator characteristics that you're going to need uh, fit those that are available. Uh, from either the um, from either the cabinets or the uh, um, other sources in Professor Balvano's office. So just to give you an idea, um, the one at the top, okay, he's got a linear. You can put a half an amp through it. It's got a dropout voltage of 2.5 volts, so at the minimum you need 7.5 volts going in to produce that 5 volts. Um, similarly, there's a 3.3 volt that you can run a half an amp off of. Um, A little bit less, um, less power-oriented uh, one, 
for with gives you a tenth of an amp. For the linear regulator, um, take the difference of the input and the output times the current load, and that's the power that you're going to burn up there. There's going to be a small amount of power okay, that's going to be shunted to ground. That the first term is the big one that's going to be in the equation. Um, are any of you planning on doing anything with an MSP 430 or 432? Because it's really cool when it comes to power. Okay? Um, it is an integrated circuit. Uh, it's a processor that is designed with power consumption uh, as one of its fundamental performance characteristics. What it does is it has a multiple uh, layering of sleep modes for components in the processor. So you can do things like you can turn off the A to D converter. You could put it into a sleep mode where it says, okay, it's going to take me so many milliseconds to get back into an operational state. All of these features uh, are programmably controlled so that you can change okay, the, the power consumption okay, almost instantaneously through the device. Do what you need to do and then power it back down again so that you, you can um, run the device um, for long periods of time all over, over from a small amount of batteries. Just an extension of that. Okay. <clears throat> what you can do is create circuits that would effectively just turn the power off for your processor okay. and um, make it so that these things it might turn it off entirely, have a timer on it so that it would bring, bring power back on when uh, at some period later. So, here's batteries, okay. and the chart at the top is basically talking about um, the energy density or the number of watt hours per unit volume. Okay. The one on the left ordinate access is power per mass. Okay. So you'll notice that um, the lithium ion batteries uh, way up there at the top. So we've got maximal uh, power versus size and power versus mass. You know, it's kind of interesting if you look up things like energy density and you look at what would you expect, what would you expect to have a lot of energy density? What would you expect? You're going to get something and you want to have a lot of energy per unit volume. You guys are engineers. What would you think? What do you think? You're going to go get a volume of something 
you want to get you want to have a lot of energy. What do you think? Uh, have a battery. A battery, all right? What more than a battery? No, I'm asking you to pick something. You've got some, you've got, somebody asked you, all right, get something that's got energy in it. Sir? Plutonium. It's right below uranium, okay? okay? Uranium is right up there at the top, okay? It's about six billion times the density of a lithium ion battery. So I would advise you to all go out and get some plutonium okay, <laughs> or some uranium, okay, and, and use that. But you know, I mean, things like, what would be another one? Oil. What? Oil. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, oil is real good. Gasoline, okay. There's a ton of energy, okay, and a little bit of gasoline in comparison to a battery. I mean, that is, ugh, puny. Gasoline is good. Uranium is really, really good. Okay. So, um, here's a little chart here for some uh, AA batteries. Um, milliamp hours is what you're going to be looking at. Okay. And so um, up there at the top, you know, a couple thousand lithium is three thousand. Okay. Um, moving on down, okay, with our lithium ion, we've got um, we've only got nineteen hundred, but of <coughs> course that's delivered at three point six volts. So the question you look at in your project is um, if you're going to use a uh, rechargeable battery in your project, how are you going to charge it? Okay. Um, if you're going to have a disposable battery, how easily can you can you change it? It turns out that um, as part of the bill of materials, something that is available uh, from Pro Professor Galvano are uh, carriers for AA batteries. You could put four AA batteries in a carrier. So that'll give you six volts. That six volts will run any of the regulators that we've seen to produce 3.3. Okay. And so you can either make put in um, disposable or rechargeable batteries that all have the double A form factor. The question is, um, when you get your project done, is it easy to change the batteries? Is it easy? Uh, do you need circuitry to charge them? So here is uh, the circuit that's required to charge a lithium ion battery. You've got a wall wart off to the side. Okay. So you're going to be <coughs> using something like one of these integrated uh, battery charger uh, circuits. Uh, nickel metal hydride, similar uh, sort of situation. The thing is, is that you've got, you would have to make room for all of these other components to use these these chargers. So the summary of all this stuff is that um, you need to know, you've measured in several of your labs, 
the current going in to run things like your alarm clock. Right? You know what the voltage is, so you know what the power is going to be. You can, when you breadboard your project, you should be able to make similar measurements. Um, figure out what kind of regulator you need. Uh, whether you need a buck or a buck boost or a linear. And remember that the average current going into your project right, has to be such that the total energy that's available in your, in your battery system has to be less than the time that you anticipate to run it. Okay, thank you.